Welcome to another video in the 30 Days of Preparedness series and that is hosted by Morgan at Rogue Preparedness and there's a bunch of us channels posting videos every day this month to help you become better prepared for any weather related or other emergency that might happen. And I have the links below to all the channels. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber, push that subscribe button and the bell icon so you're notified of future videos. Okay, today we're gonna to talk about 10 water and food storage tips. Number one, the government will provide or in brackets, procrastination. Why do I include both of those as number one? Well, I think most of you watching this video probably aren't sure if the government will provide if there's a big enough disaster. So I don't think that covers you, but unfortunately it does cover the masses for most part. But procrastination is something that we all suffer from sometimes. I mean, right now, have you been watching the news videos? There might be a shortage for um, olive oil and for tomato products. And it's because of the bad drought. So have you went out, purchased, you know, your ketchup, your spaghetti sauce, your canned tomatoes, if you don't can your own, and gotten reserves for virgin olive oil? If you haven't, you're procrastinating. You wanna do it when you know something is about to happen. That's number one. Number two, people seem to concentrate on food before water. Now, we all know water is very important. And you know those rules of three, right? You got uh, three minutes without oxygen, I think without air, uh, three hours without shelter, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So as you can see, food is in here. Water right at the beginning. So, storing enough water for your family is really, really important. And look at the recent news. Here we have in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, they've had recent torrential rain coupled with years of water system issues have resulted in a crisis where they don't have enough water to fight fires, flush toilets, or even hand out to residents in need. And then we have the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico, who declared an emergency because of the largest wildfire in New Mexico's history contaminated their river, and the city relies solely on water from that river, which has been tainted with large amounts of fire-related debris and ash. Now, my understanding is New Mexico has found a temporary, like a 30-day plan to get them through, and then they're working on their filtering plants, and hopefully they will find a solution. But when you listen to the news, you're hearing about droughts everywhere, or you're hearing about flooding. <laughs> it goes either way. And wildfires. So, make sure that you have enough water stored for your family. It's estimated that we need one gallon of water per day, about three-fourths of that is for actually drinking, and the rest is for hygiene and cooking needs. And of course, it doesn't have to be just water. You could have fluids from other beverages too. Now, the exact amount you need might vary. I mean, if you're also where they've been having that rate, 112 temperature, you might need to have more water. Um, so it depends on your climate needs and on your own dietary needs. But that's just... A guide one gallon per person per day number three not storing any physical water because you have a water filter and multiple ways to disinfect water so you're fine no you're not something could happen that your water filter won't filter out what is needed now I know a lot of preppers believe in their Berkey water filter. I mean, it seems to be almost miraculous for all the things it can do. However, I am concerned about Berkey because it is not NSF standard 53 certified 
and they say, well, it costs too much, or our independent lab is better. Well, then just do it for one year, prove that you're as good as all the other filters or better, and that's fine. You're making a lot of profits from your company. Get the same certification that the other water filter companies do. Why not? You know, sometimes the lady doth protest too much. But even if you have a water filter and it's working great, what happens if you have a faulty filter? What happens if a filter breaks and you don't have a backup? I mean, a lot of different things can happen. So you always need to have some physical water stored and alternative ways to disinfect water. And you know, one of the best ways is boiling, but if you aren't able to do that, you can use bleach, you can use pool shock, um, those little camping little things for iodine for your water, whatever. But the Smart Prepper has physical water, water filtering system, and alternative ways to disinfect. Number four, not determining what type of food storage is best for your family. You just follow a YouTuber who makes a lot of sense and you think, hey, that's what's best for my family. But it might not be. Food storage is not one size fits all. You need to tailor it to your family's needs. Do you have any special dietary needs? Uh, do you have some picky eaters? And you can say, well, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat it. Well, with kids, maybe not uh, before it really is affecting their health. Maybe you've tried the most inexpensive way out there, right? You're storing enough beans and rice for your family to get through. But have you included, you know, extra spices and maybe broths and hot sauce? other things to use or to add to those beans and rice, you know, like canned veggies, for instance. That is really important. Could you get by on just beans and rice? Yes, but boy, would it be dismal at mealtime. Maybe you've went the freeze-dried route, you know, you can get the meals already prepared, in a nice bucket, and that, that's good as a backup. Um, but my family, we don't usually use too many packaged foods. So it's not the way we eat. For me, to mimic more what we're used to, is I um, pressure can a lot of meats and stews and soup. And then of course, I have canned vegetables and other items and maybe freeze dried to use in conjunction with that. But that's what makes my family happiest. What makes your family happiest? You know, I hear about people who actually, you know, buy one of those buckets, whatever, and then they actually taste the food and they're not too happy. You know, it's more like a, a soup every day. So make sure you buy something in small quantities. Make sure your family likes it before you get a case of it. Ooh, and one more thing, make sure, I don't know about your family, but my family, we also have two cats. Many of you see Xander the black cat. Um, make sure you have pet food stocked. And of course I have some, I call them livestock, but they're pretty small. I have rabbits and I have chickens. So I wanna make sure that I also have enough food for them. So be sure you take in your whole family for consideration. Number five, not storing basic kit. Here comes Sander. Did I mention it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not storing basic kitchen staples and spices for recipes. Very, very important. Uh, you know, do you have baking powder? Do you have baking soda, yeast, cooking oil? powdered eggs, if you're not lucky enough for me to get real eggs, um, salt, bullion cubes, cornmeal, cornstarch, barbecue sauce, hot sauce, all those di different things. And of course, spices, you gotta have your garlic and you have to have onions and 
All those type of things. Think about what you use on a daily basis in your recipes and do you have them stored in your pantry? So six, improper storage methods. Do you have the right container for what you're trying to store? I use a combination of buckets, mylar bags, and glass jars, basically. And that works for me. My glass jars, of course, are what I'm storing all my canned tomato, my canned meat, all, all the things that I'm home canning. And then I also have the bigger ones that I store sugar in. That works really well for me. And for the buckets, I might have Mylar bags in the bucket and have beans or rice, um, those type of items, oats, that type of thing put in the buckets. Now in a five pound bucket, it can actually hold 36 pounds of rice. That's a lot of rice. And that was how I did it in the beginning, only I could hold even more because I had six pound buckets. But you open a bucket, it's open, right? I'm not going to use 50 pounds of rice in one week or one month even. So I have learned now that I vacuum seal Mylar bags in smaller quantities. It could be a meal quantity, it could be what I use for a week, maybe a month, but I don't do the huge bag and have 50 pounds of rice sealed in a bucket anymore. I think that's an important thing. If you're actually going to use this and rotate it, make sure that your portion sizes are right for your storage. Now remember when I said I use glass jars for storage? Well, this is actually a uh, coleslaw mix that I've dehydrated. But I live in a pretty earthquake-proof area. Um, you may not. Glass breaks, right? So. If you're using glass jars for your storage, make sure you have a system that protects them and insulates them from shattering. Very, very important. So again, you got to decide where you live and what are the things that you battle. So do you know when to use oxygen absorbers and when not to? I have heard of people that put them in their salt and in their sugar and then when they need it, it's like, you got a brick of sugar, right? It's completely solid. You do not want to use oxygen absorbers for certain things that you are putting by. Do you know though the right amount to use of oxygen absorbers? Or do you just put in, you know, you got a 2,500 cc, just put it in everything because you figure, hey, I'm covered. Well, there is a handy chart. USA Emergency Supply has this chart to help you determine how many oxygen absorbers are needed. And I'll put the link down below. And do you use desiccant packages? I know a lot of people do. Um, I do not. You have to be careful about combining an oxygen absorber and a desiccant. Because a desiccant is going to take out the moisture, right? Good idea. Um, but when you combine it with the oxygen absorber, the oxygen absorber does need a little bit of moisture to work. So you could be making an environment ripe for botulism. So you have to be careful. Now, I had vacuum sealed this, but let's say I wanted to use it, something that I'm every week taking a tablespoon of or something, then I might want to have a desiccant um, packet in here with a, just a simple lid, twist off, just to keep it safe. But for long term, I don't do it. I just vacuum seal it. Number seven, not inspecting your food preps and water preps regularly and not having a solid inventory. You know, I mean, I've done it before. Store and forget, right? I mean, I do that with my, what I call my working pantry because I have my pantry connected to the kitchen. I also have in the hallway uh, another coat closet that we've repurposed and I have my bigger pantry which is more for prepping long term downstairs. So sometimes I forget and go out and buy something that I already have and I should be rotating through. It's always a good idea though to inspect your preps. Um, here's an example when I had looked one year 
I had certain items in buckets with gamma lids and look what happened with the lid. Nice tear in the top. That means it's letting oxygen in. And I did not store one bucket with a gamma lid and another gamma lid bucket on top. This was had nothing on top of it. It must have been just a faulty lid. So you want to check that. You want to look over your canned goods. Are they bulging? Not a good sign, right? And even your home canned lids. Maybe you didn't have a complete seal like you thought. You want to make sure that things are really sealed appropriately. Otherwise, you're going to have to throw this food away. But of course, remember, best buy dates does not mean you have to throw something away. It's just when after that period of time, it might not taste as good or the nutrients might be lacking. And on the same vein, do you have an accurate inventory? Uh, you might be using Prepper Nerds inventory. Uh, I've used that. That's a great way to keep up to date and really know how much you have for your family's needs. But make sure you regularly inventory what you have and check the condition of what you have. So when you need it, you're going to go, oh God, no, right? Number eight, all your food is stored in the same place. You know, most of us, we only have one place to store our food. It's our house, right? Well, if that's the case, at least make sure you have it in different areas of your house, not all in one area. Because what happens if you have a fire, if you have an earthquake, uh, if it gets, your basement gets flooded and all your stuff gets ruined? Make sure you have at least different areas of your food and water storage. The smart person has food and water stored at their friends, their relatives, and maybe they're even renting a self-storage unit for that purpose. Number nine, not having contingency plans. And by that, I mean, oh, well, what I just mentioned, if somebody is storing their food at a friend's or relative's, they have a contingency plan, right? They can go there and get some food um, if theirs was somehow destroyed. But I'm talking about a little bit more longer term contingency plan. If something happened, what would you do? Now, I think it is an excellent idea that everybody knows how to garden, whether it be a large garden or a container garden on your deck. Whatever you can do is at least supplementing something. And then learning what you can eat around you. You know, what can you forage? What mushrooms are okay? What berries are okay to eat? Are there different roots that you can actually dig up and eat in your area? Are there things other than dandelions that can make a salad? Learning foraging specific for where you live, I think is a very, very important skill. And of course, knowing how to fish, hunt, and trap also are great contingency plans. Number 10. And I think we have all suffered from this at some time. And that is growing complacent. Hey, you get a little get tired about continuously, continuously prepping. And you start thinking, hey, you know, they keep warning us, but nothing really happens. So I'm probably okay with what I have. Let me tell you, the best thing is to make prepping part of your lifestyle. You're not doing it because of fear of something happened. It's just smart. You want to keep your family safe and you want to have the preps you can have so you can survive daily emergencies as well as regional ones. So don't grow complacent. Well, that's it for my 10 tips. I hope you're watching all the other prepping videos this month. And I hope you're not just watching things. I hope you're doing things, right? Putting food by whatever needs to be done. 
As always, thank you so, so much for watching. Thumbs up if you like this video. And as always, please subscribe and share the knowledge. Thank you.